Good, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the local review body. Can I please inform all members of the public and officers that today's meeting will be recorded and will be available on the Council's website following the meeting. Can I also ask if any of any phones or electronic devices, they are set preferably to off or certainly to silent. Uh, my name is Councillor Lewis Simpson. I'm the convener of the local review body and I'm joined today on my right by Councillor uh, Bob, <coughs> Councillor Bob Braun, I beg your pardon, Bob, and on my left by Councillor Tom Gray. Um, on my far right is Mr. David Harrison, who is the planning advisor to the LRB. He is not part of the planning department and has had no previous involvement in any of the applications on the agenda today. On my left is Mr. Jeff Fogg, legal advisor to the LRB, and on my far left is Mr. Danny Williams, of committee services. We're also joined in the front row by Mrs. Christine Bryan of the planning service, who takes notes and takes back any learning points to her colleagues along the road. And most important of all, we have Mina here on the, on the magic lantern, who's going to make sure that all the IT works well today, aren't they, Mina? Well, that's good, thanks. Thank you. Now, um, we have a relatively uh, light burden to deal with today but it's difficult to give you an idea of how long this meeting might last. So it is our intention to have a short recess at, at half past 12, if we're, if we're still talking at that point. Um, declarations of interest. Can I ask colleagues, are there any declarations of interest by members on any item on the agenda today? Councillor Brown. No. Councillor Brown. No, <coughs> nor have I. Um, can we note the uh, minute of the last meeting? Agreed. All right, that's fine. And now we will move to the first item on the agenda, which is item 4.1, which is uh, an application for an extension to a dwelling house at West Wind St. David's Maddery Creef. Can I ask if there's anybody here from that application? Welcome. Mr. Harrison, can I ask you to introduce the application for review? Uh, thank you, convener. I assume everybody can hear what I'm saying. Uh, as you say, this is a detailed planning application for the extension of a dwelling house at Westwinds, St. David's, Maddery. The existing house is a chalet-style bungalow with accommodation within the roof space. The extensions would, be mainly, would mainly involve a one-and-a-half-storey wing with an additional wraparound single-storey extension and pitched roof dormers serving the existing upper floor space. There would also be some remodelling of the doors and windows and cladding of external walls in timber and re-rendering of walls also. The proposed ridge line would match the existing house. I'll just take you through the photographs now, but we might like to have page 223 onwards, uh, provide you a location plan, a site plan, and of course drawings of the extension. The general sequence of the photographs will be the, the site from the main road then the site from the side road, the site of the extension itself, and the front garden. So as I say, this first photograph is us on the main road through St. David's, uh, looking towards the, the frontage, as it were, of the, the house as it stands at the moment, which as you can see is uh, partly behind the screen fence. And then swinging slightly to the uh, left of that photograph, uh, we see the remainder of that frontage and, of course, some of the mature trees in that far corner. Moving down, as it were, to the access, you see on the extreme left-hand side of the photograph there onto, as it were, what might be called the side road. Uh, we then uh, see at that corner into the application site. Uh, the extension, just to be clear, are, of course, largely on the far side of the house from this particular position in the far corner, as it were. Moving and swinging slightly to the left of that photograph, uh, we're looking down the side road and that side gable elevation, and this photograph will pick up some of the, the trees, as it were, to the rear of the house, and also the development on the separate road, uh, which you'll see in the location plan further, further down. And swinging slightly further to the left of that photograph again, uh, we look down that road to those properties further to the north. So if we go down to the access that you see uh, most closely to you there, we can now look into the application site. 
uh, and this gives an approximate indication of the position of the main part of the extension in that photograph, I say on the, the rear side of the application site as seen from the main road that is. And if we go into the application site from there, uh, just to give you an indication of the, the plan area as well at the same time. And then moving on from that position, we move around, as it were, to the other boundary, the eastern side of the application site. And again, just to give you an indication of the position of the extensions on that side. Uh, and just to be clear, the blue line shows the extension which would be set to the rear, not to the front. The front is, of course, a lesser extension. Swinging slightly to the right of that photograph, as it were, we look over that boundary uh, into the garden adjacent, uh, and you can see that area is generally used uh, as open space uh, in relation to children's play. Swinging to the left of that photograph now, we go back to looking along the whole frontage of that south elevation, which of course has the slight wraparound element to it. We swing to the left of that photograph again, where we take in the remainder of that front garden area, looking in a westerly direction. And you can probably just make out the, the house on the opposite side of the side road, uh, beyond the trees at the far end of the garden there. If we go from that position up to the far corner of the garden, we then can look back to that front elevation and from the same position again, swinging slightly to the left of that, we take in the gable uh, and that looking in that northerly di direction down the, as it were, the side garden area of the property. And moving from that position, we as it move up back to where we were starting in the driveway uh, and from that driveway position, just to identify the area of the proposed parking you'll, you'll have in the drawings. So I'll leave you with that general photograph. Turning first of all in summary to the applicant's case, the proposal would remove the existing garage and outbuildings in the northeastern corner of the plot. This is seen as a benefit to the amenity of the area. The design and materials of the present house are not seen as being sympathetic to this rural location and the proposal would create a more appropriate traditional building using off-white smooth render, slate and overcladding the existing dry dash render with timber cladding. This is seen as updating and improving the appearance of the house. The present footprint of the house is some 100 square metres and the extension would add some 70 square metres. The total footprint of some 170 square metres would cover approximately one-seventh of the total plot area, and it is not therefore considered to result in an overdevelopment. A combination of using opaque glazing to an ensuite window, distances from the public road, and existing mature trees are seen as obviating any potential residential amenity impacts on neighbouring properties or the general locality. Turning now to the officer's report of handling and summary, the site lies within the settlement boundary of St David's. Extensions to houses are expected to be appropriate to the location and to avoid adverse negative impacts. This proposal is not seen as meeting these criteria due to the cumulative impact of the various alterations and the different building forms that would be added to the existing house. These are seen as having contrasting and excessive scales and lacking in symmetry in relation to the host building. While it is recognised that there is scope to enlarge the house and to adopt a more contemporary finish, it is considered that the design would need to be streamlined to be in keeping with the scale of the house and the character of the locality. There is some concern that the introduction of windows in close proximity to the boundary may impact on existing residential amenity. In this case, there are no representations and there is neither a request for a site visit nor a hearing. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harrison. Um, 
Are there any questions for officers on the application for review? Um, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Reg. Just one, um, you mentioned that the extension would be slight. Well, no, I'm, I suspect that's, that's, that's Carl. Is that Luke and Lily Lily's as well? So we need to line, or what? Uh, yes. So that we are uniform. The, the uh, as, you can, as you rightly say, the, the existing house has a, a concrete tile roof, uh, and the, um, the submission by the agent does refer to slate being used, uh, I think, as part of the remove to create a re has it were effectively recreate the appearance of the house as a more traditional property in the countryside um, I would say I've actually been in touch with the agent on that matter uh, to try and get some clarification and uh, they've confirmed that the intention would be to use slate uh, in other words more recent submission uh, should take precedence over what you see in the drawings councillor Gray any questions from you I have no questions either, um, colleagues. So, members, um, can we proceed to determine the application for review on the basis of the information before us, that is, the information contained within the papers and the presentation by the planning advisor, or do we require more information? Uh, Councillor Brown. Councillor Gray? No, I'm happy that we have sufficient information as well. So, um, I think we'll move to debate, and um, having considered the applicant's papers, the report of handling, the Perth and North Local Development Plan, and all relevant material plan planning considerations, I, I will start us off. Um, I think, colleagues, with this one, it's, it seems to me that although it's an extension to an existing house, the overall result will be similar to a to a, to a rebuild, and the, with all the extensions, it will be a, a very different house. Uh, I'm concerned that it is um, so close to the to the boundaries, and uh, also concerned ab about the scale. So, uh, I feel, having considered this, and particularly having seen the photographs, uh, I'm uh, I'm minded to um, uphold the, the decision notice. Councillor Brown, do you have any questions? Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one. <laughs> um, it's not a listed building. It's uh, not really uh, overlooked by other properties. Um, I feel the extension is uh, suitable. I think it will wrap around the house and remove the old outbuildings. Um, and once finished, it would appear that it's going to be put into contrast with the existing building. Um, feel once done, you wouldn't notice the, in, you know, the old building was there. It would be there, it would be fine. Um, I think it's within the, 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 uh, the grounds of a property. Um, applicant uh, wants to change the property. As I say, it's not overlooked. It's not a listed building. I, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be able to do it. So I would, in this case, overturn the decision and allow the extension to be built, um, subject to usual conditions that it's, it would be the government plans and whatever, but it's maybe just a uniform approach to the to the build. So yes, I would um, would uh, change the decision making. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bar. Uh, Councillor Gray. Uh, right, you know, I'm going against it again. Uh, I've got to say I'm more in line with the convener in this one. I think the design itself is rather incongruous, a mix of a variety of modern features uh, in very strong contrast to the vicinity in which this building would lie. Um, the scaling, again, is incongruous to the particular neighbourhood. Um, and really, these are the two issues that bother me, the design and the incongruous nature of it and the scale of it just are a bad fit for this particular site. Uh, and I'd uh, stick with the decision. Thank you very much, Councillor Gray. So, Mr. Fogg, that leaves you um, 2-1 um, to uphold the reasons of refusal. The, the only um, slight change I would want to make um, would be on the first line of the second paragraph. I think when it refers to policy RD1, it should specifically refer to part C. If that's okay. 
and when it refers to policy PM1B, I think it should only be part C. But if that, if, if Councillor Gray has a view on it. In relation to PM1B, did you say it is criterion C only and not D? If you just bear with me. So in relation to policy RD1 residential areas, you're drawing particularly on uh, criterion C, which is to say the proposals have to improve the character and environment of the area of, and village in respect of uh, policy background policy PM1B. You're agreeing with um, placemaking criteria C, that's to say the design should complement surroundings in terms of appearance, height, scale, massing, um, but you're not concurring with the um, uh, employment of the criteria thereafter. That's to say, respect an existing building line where appropriate or establish one where none exists. Yeah, I think part C covers Councillor Gray's point. Yeah. So I, I realise that was not the answer you were looking for, but that's our decision. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. So we now move to item um, 4.2, which is a planning application for the extension of a dwelling house in principle, land 30 metres west of Craigality Chapel Hill. Can I ask if there's anybody here tonight? Um, Mr. Harrison, can I ask you to introduce the application for review? Thank you, Convener. As you say, this is an uh, application in principle for the erection of a dwelling house at land 30 metres west of Craigalachie, uh, Chapel Hill. The application site is mainly an area of grassland on a former railway. I'll just take you straight to the photographs now, but you might like to have page 93 onwards provides you the location plan and the site plan. The general sequence of the photographs will be the site and the adjoining land as seen from the public road, the main area of the site, and then the strip forming the railway, and then the applicant's house. So I say this is us looking in an easterly direction uh, while on the main road, uh, and you see the application site there fronting onto the main road, uh, moving slightly to the right of that photograph, still on the main road, uh, but we get the main body, as it were, of the application site. And in the photograph, you can see the what appears to be a former corrugated iron business-style hut uh, and the background of the uh, hedge separating, separating it from Craigalachie. Moving again slightly to the right of that photograph, uh, we look down the adjoining field, as it were, to the application site. Uh, I can just pick up the applicant's house uh, willow view from the far distance within that photograph as well. Uh, but you can see how the, uh, shall we say, the site uh, continues down the length of the railway line there. Moving on from that, we now move up, as it were, still in the main road, but looking into, as it were, the body of the application site and the section of railway stretching beyond. Uh, and then moving into the site from there uh, with just a detail of the, the building that's on the site at the moment. And then, as it were, moving around to the back of the building, uh, we see the other elevation and some uh, other material lying on the site. Swinging around to the right of that, we then take ourselves to the, the back of the main part of the application site, the corner, as it were, between the main part and the, uh, the, the longitudinal section of it. And this is us looking into the field to the northeast. Uh, and to be clear, that's the field which lies within the settlement boundary. If 
whole sea field out with the settlement boundary a little later on. So if we swing round to the right of that photograph, in a similar position, but within the body of the application site, we look down the length of the, uh, shall we say, linear section of the application site, and we have willow view identified there. Uh, and to be clear, so we have the field on the left-hand side of the red line uh, being within the settlement boundary, but the field on the right-hand side uh, being out with the settlement boundary, as is the application site itself. So moving down, as it were, from that position, we go down towards the end of that uh, section of the railway, as it were, first of all to look across the field towards the applicant's house, Willow View, and swing round to the right of that. We have the end, the southernmost end of the application site. Swing round to the right of that again. We then look at the, into the field on the, shall we say, the, the western side of the application site. And from there, swing round to the right again, we look down, as it were, the linear section of the application site. Swing round again to the right of that, similar position, we look across the field which is within the, the boundary of the settlement. Uh, moving from that, this is the access road, the separate access road which serves Willow View itself. And then I'll just leave you with that general photograph of the main site. Turning first of all in summary to the applicant's case, in 2010, the applicant applied for their large garden to be included within the local development plan settlement boundary. Only part of the garden was subsequently included in the current local development plan. Consequently, they applied again in 2014 for the remainder, including the application site, to be defined as lying within the settlement boundary. There is a concern that the documents submitted through this process do not appear to have been added to the Council's website and may not have been taken into account in this application. That submission may have been confused with the site uh, in relation to an earlier submission by Errol Park Estate. There is also a concern that the officer, in referring to the refusal of Planning Commission some 13 years ago, did not appreciate the change from a 60 to 30 mile an hour speed limit and the granting of permission for three other houses within 200 yards which are served by the same main road. It is not considered that weight should be given to the wording of policy six in the forthcoming local development plan because, it is because that plan is still under consideration. Under policy eight of local development plan two concerning rural business and diversification the site is directly adjacent to a bungalow and opposite a semi-detached cottage, which are not seen as being part of the principal settlement. The applicant's wife ran a childminding service locally for many years. The applicant is seeking to build a house for their retirement and envisages that someone else could continue a childminding business from their present house, Willow View, which has an, has an extensive equipped garden for that purpose. In that context, the proposal is viewed as meeting an operational need. The new house would also contribute to the housing land supply. The applicant draws attention to the granting of permission for three houses at Hoxton, a steading conversion at Leetown, and a proposal for four houses off Cotton Road. These are seen as demonstrating that there is a demand for houses in this locality. In conclusion, the proposal is viewed as according with Local Deve Development Plan Policy RD3 as a brownfield site as part of a former railway line which contains the remains of a former barn. It is also seen as complying with Part 3.4 of Category 3 of the Housing in the Countryside Guide as a house for local people as the applicant has lived at Cotterm for 30 years. The site is also seen as meeting the siting criteria by retaining hedges, 
and is a definable site, the appearance of which would be improved by the proposed development by removing a redundant commercial yard and building. The applicant has presented a SWOT analysis of the proposal and this can be found on pages 54 and, 50, and begin 54 and 55. Turning now in summary to the officer's report of handling, the site lies to the west of the Cottom Chapel Hill settlement boundary. It forms a long linear strip along and adjacent to the settlement boundary. It was part of a former railway line. It also contains a small shed. As the site is out with but adjacent to the settlement boundary, it falls to be assessed against local development plan policy PM4, which presumes against development. While of limited weight in assessing the proposal, attention is drawn to the proposed local development plan P, development plan 2, policy 6, that confirms, updates and goes further by limiting development in such circumstances to operational and locational need being demonstrated and no alternative sites being available or where there is a housing landfall, land shortfall or it is related to a rural business or diversification. None of these circumstances are present in this instance in the officer's opinion. In conclusion, the proposal is contrary to local development plan policy PM4 as a development out with a defined settlement. In this case, there are no representations. There is a request for a site visit, but no request for a hearing. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Harrison. Are there any questions for officers on the application for review? Uh, Councillor Gray. No. Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, I, I have no questions either, colleagues. So, members, can we proceed to determine the application for review on the basis of the information before us, that is, the information contained within the papers and the presentation by the planning advisor, or do we require more information? Councillor Gray? Yes. Councillor Brown? I, I, too, am happy to proceed. Um, so we'll move to debate. Can I ask you, uh, Councillor Gray, having considered the applicant's papers, the report of handling, the Perth and Kinross Local Development Plan and all other relevant material planning considerations to start us up? Right, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, clearly, this is out with the, the, uh, uh, the, the site, um, out with the community site, and it really, I cannot see any reason why we would wish to change uh, in this case. I don't see any local need uh, other houses have been built locally. I can't see a need uh, relating to the present owner who is already in a house to say that he needs a house there because he has always stayed there. When that applicant has a house already, uh, I can't get my head around that one. Uh, it's simply out with the boundary of the community and therefore uh, I think we're along with the, the decision already given. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Gray. Uh, Councillor Braun. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think I just have to uh, agree with uh, Councillor Gray. I can't see any reason to, uh, to change the decision that's been made. It is out with settlement boundaries. Um, I think that although there's very, very various arguments been put forward, ultimately it still comes back to that point. So I would have to agree with the uh, planning officer. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor. We, we don't always agree in this committee, maybe for the last time, but on this occasion I, I do agree with my colleagues. Um, there comes a point with settlement boundaries where we are, we are obliged to uphold them unless there is some overriding consideration why we should not do so. And uh, like my colleagues, I, I fail to see any, any, any reason to, to um, overturn the, the, the reasons for refusal. So I think that's a, a three in favour, Mr. F Mr. Fong. Um, the only thing I think I don't know if um, Councillor would like to add anything to the refusal. I just feel perhaps we could say something about the, the fact that there are no other um, overriding considerations or circumstances which would make a change of boundary uh, acceptable. So 
Or perhaps, perhaps uh, Mr. Harrison or Mr. Bell could make, make that make that sound better. You know. Uh, I, I take your comment as meaning that you would add into the reasons for refusal given in the decision notice. Um, what's the effect of it? And there are no identified reasons for. Um, approving the proposal of the development plan departure or so I realise that wasn't the answer you were looking for but we've made our decision so thank you very much for your attendance thank you so colleagues we move on now to item um, 43 which are alterations to boundary wall, formation of hard standing and erection of retaining walls in retrospect to Croft Terrace Errol. And I assume there's no one here from that application. We are from that application, I think. Right. Um, welcome, welcome, thank you. I thought you were just keen saying I'm here some more. Uh, so, um, Mr. Harrison, can you introduce this application, please? Yes, thank you, convener. The planning application in detail for the alteration to boundary wall, formation of hard standing and erection of retaining walls in retrospect at Two Croft Terrace, Errol by Perth. The house is a semi-detached category C listed building of arts and crafts style within the Errol conservation area. The frontages of Croft Terrace have long downward sloping gardens onto a narrow private lane. Croft Terrace is a narrow no through lane serving some five properties. With the exception of one house, the properties have no off-street parking. The gardens to the rear are small and have no vehicular access. I'll take you through the photographs now, but you might like to have page one, two, three onwards to provide you with a location plan and a site plan. The general sequence of the photographs will be the access as seen from Gas Bray, the access lane and then the parking space. So the first photograph is us on Gas Lane, uh, Gas Bray, I beg your pardon, uh, looking, as it were, down the slope from the main part of Errol. Uh, the access is more or less opposite to the car, the grey car you see in the middle distance there. <coughs> I beg your pardon. So if we go down the lane, uh, we're now looking, as it were, back up, albeit in another day, uh, and we see the entry into Croft Terrace immediately on the left-hand side of the photograph there, just beyond the rendered wall. So if we swing slightly to the, the uh, left of that photograph, uh, we're now looking up that wall. And the reason for taking this photograph is to show there's a slight, uh, shall we say, staggering between the two sides of the access onto Gasbury at that point. Uh, and also to show you the, the, the general width of the pavement, the narrow width of the pavement at that side as well. So from there, we move on to look at it more obliquely, uh, that, that entry, and then uh, we actually look directly into the lane itself. Moving up the lane, now I stress it's a private road, uh, we then can look back to the entry onto Gas Bray. When we swing around to the left of that, uh, we see the wall, the wall is basically on both sides of the lane, looking, say, in a westerly direction. And as you'll see, just beyond the, the wall on the right-hand side, uh, there's an entry into the property there. So this is Tayview with its own access, parking and turning facility. Swinging to the left of that, we go back into the lane and we'll go a bit further down. We're just beginning to approach the application site, the edge of which is shown by the, the yellow dotted line, just to be clear. And we go further down from there. Uh, so there's at the far end, looking back, as it were, to where we've just been, the very end of the lane. And then as we swing to the left of that photograph, uh, we take in the parking area that's been formed. Swinging again to the left of that photograph, we see the part the corner of the parking area, but also, of course, the applicant's house behind that. And to the right of that, we actually see the house as it is now, 
straight on, as it were, with the new gates and railings and walls uh, and the raised aerial garden leading up to the front door. Turning to the left of that photograph, we catch the corner of the parking area, but we also now see the rest of the terrace uh, further on, which is only served by a pedestrian access beyond the little sort of outhouses or coal sheds uh, you see there at the end of the lane. And just to move on from that, you can see that pedestrian access in this photograph too. So I'll just leave you with that general photograph of the parking area involved. Turning first of all in summary to the applicant's case, the applicant considers that the assessment of the proposal has not undertaken, was not undertaken appropriately by the officer's report because it does not take adequate account of the applicant's desire for parking considering her mobility difficulties and road safety and vehicle movement aspects referred to in the supporting statement. In particular, the applicant has a right to use the lane and refusal of the proposal would not prevent such continued usage. The provision of the parking space is seen as improving the present road safety situation. The, pro the proposal only requires planning permission because the site lies within aero conservation area. This additional control relates to the potential impact of development on built heritage and not road safety considerations. The report of handling indicates no concerns in relation to built heritage and Scottish Government has granted listed building consent for the works. It is not seen as reasonable for the proposal to be refused on road safety grounds. The report of handling is also seen as giving undue weight to a single late representation which errone erroneously states that no other residents drive on the lane. It is noted that the most easterly property has its own driveway and parking. In any event, the right to drive on the lane is seen as a legal matter rather than a planning consideration. The report of handling is not considered to explain the link that is drawn between the lack of turning space and local development plan policy PM1B part E, which seeks to ensure that new proposals have safe accessibility for all. This proposal is specifically intended to provide improved accessibility for the applicant and her husband who have limited mobility. The reversing of cars off and onto Gasbury from this private lane is not seen as a matter for the council and the proposal is seen as being no different from the present situation. The consultee response from Rhodes is seen as a standardised response. The applicant's assessment of manoeuvring to and from the site can be found on page 131. Turning now in summary to the officer's report of handling, the previous application for this proposal was refused under delegated powers and subsequently refused by the local review body. The related appeal against the refusal of listed building consent has been upheld and listing building consent has been granted for the works involved. The reporter's view that the proposed works would not fail to preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area are noted and accepted. The applicant's desire for off-street parking due to their mobility difficulties is understood. However, Croft Terrace is not seen as being suitable for traffic and visibility at its junction with Gasbury is very poor. Transport planning object to the proposal due to the lack of manoeuvring space to allow the car to enter or leave the lane in a forward gear. Consequently, despite sympathising with the applicant's personal circumstances, the officer concludes that the proposal should be declined due to these road safety considerations. In this case, there was one representation. It was a late representation, mainly expressing concern regarding road safety matters. In this case, there is neither a request for a site visit nor a hearing. Thank you, convener.
Thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Harrison. Are there any questions for officers in the application for review? Uh, Councillor Brock. Thank you, Convener. Um, just a couple of questions. Firstly, on the page 153, I just wondered if you could, might be able to clarify a point on the, this is the um, traffic planning report. It says on the third paragraph, the proposed site plan shows an insufficient one metre opening. I just wondered if that, well, that was. That's our first question. Uh, yes. Uh, well, if we turn to page Uh, one, two, three, which gives you the site plan. Right, thanks. Uh, I can only assume uh, that what the officer may have been re may have been referring to, because I could say I can only assume this, mm. is the approximately one meter wide gap uh, in the red dotted lines. Oh, right. Uh, which obviously, is, if you like, is the shadow of the, uh, the, the former wall and pedestrian entry into the garden in the past. Uh, but the, the gap, of course, is, as you can see in the photograph here, uh, is, is no longer in that position, as it were. Yeah. The wall has moved back yeah. uh, and we have a new uh, pedestrian entry. Right, okay. And um, if you say of the other property... Tayview does use the drive, part of it, just to get through to the lane entrance. Yes, yeah, Tayview is the, the first property yeah, first on the yeah. right-hand side as you enter into the lane. Okay. Uh, and I can take you back to the photograph, but that was, okay. as you see, their own yeah. access, separate independent access and parking and turning facility. Okay. And the other last question is probably just an opinion, I think. Looking at that photograph there, um, average size vehicle, could, could that get on there and not block the lane? That's what I... You could, could you park a vehicle yes, in that I'm physically in that space? Oh, so it doesn't obstruct the, ob obstruct the lane at all. It would just yes, I mean the the, the the actual should we say the width of it is about slightly over two point nine, uh, yeah. uh, two point five is usually a parking space yeah. width, uh, and the length of it would be sufficient physically yeah. to accommodate With a vehicle. So it's always difficult to tell yes, what size of vehicle you're opinion, talking about. That's an opinion. So I'm but I'm 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 an average size vehicle could be taken off yes. and not block the lane. Yeah. Yes, okay, fine. physically placed on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Brock. Councillor Gray, any questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Paul, um, we've had professional advice which has said the access is unsuitable, and the question is on refusal on that basis uh, of the safety of the access from the gas bray. Um, does, should we approve this, would we have a liability regarding uh, overturning uh, professional advice on this issue? I would say not. Um, the, this is a decision to be made by the Council's Planning Authority and provided it's made in good faith. Um, I don't think um, it would be possible to liability to the council in the event that there was an injury um, by somebody making use of the, the route. So whatever the concerns you might have about this on its merits or otherwise, I don't think that should be one of them. Thank you. I have a, a, a question in a similar vein. I'm not sure whether it's for, for you, Mr. Fogg, or Mr. Harrison, but just to be absolutely clear, we, we have no powers to prevent people using this lane um, to go up and down in their cars or whatever else they want to go up and down in, is there? It's an unadopted uh, road or, 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 or pathway, um, so it's, uh, as far as I can see, it's out with the uh, control or the, or the remit of the Council's Planning Authority, how it's used. If I concur with that, yes. Uh, no, uh, no further questions from me. Um, so, um, members, can we proceed to determine the application for review on the basis of the information before us, that is, the information contained within the papers and the presentation by the planning advisor, or do we require more information? Councillor Gray. No, I'm happy with that. 
comfortably and happy to proceed. I too am happy to proceed. So we'll move to debate. Can I ask you, Councillor Braun, having considered the applicant's papers, the report of handling, Perth and Gross Local Development Plan, and all other relevant material planning considerations to start us off? Thank you, Convener. Um, I think from the pictures and the plans, we know this is a quite a difficult um, turning to get in and out of. Um, the paperwork came before us some months ago um, and it was uh, unanimously turned down. Well, at the time, of course, the list of building consent wasn't in place. That's now there. Um, I think on balance, given the, the, uh, condition, uh, the, the mobility of the applicant, the fact that they now have a parking area in place which is uh, consented, um, I'm inclined to allow this to go ahead, I think, uh, on balance. It is, as I say, a difficult turning. Uh, you can go forwards. You could, of course, reverse back in. Uh, it's not a busy road, I believe, Gaspray. So, um, and given that the car will be off the actual terrace and won't cause an obstruction, um, my inclination is to allow this to proceed. Um, I think anybody living here would be sensible to, well, they can't condition it, but they have the sense to own a car appropriate to the area and to the size of the parking area in the road. Um, so yes, I think on this occasion I would be prepared to overturn the decision and, and allow it to go ahead. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Brock. Councillor Green. Yeah, I'm very much in agreement with that. Um, this is, is a private concern, the fact that it is a private road and a private desire to take a car in there is entirely up to the person uh, so wishing to do, uh, to have a car which is suitable to such a space and uh, suitable to their needs and would not be applying for permission unless they thought they could, uh, such a vehicle could be accommodated there. Um, and I can see no other reason for refusing it. The, the access is only used by pedestrians and not many at that uh, to the house beyond. Um, Thank you, Councillor Gray. Um, we, we don't always agree, as you know, on this, but on this occasion, um, I find that uh, I know Errol fairly well, and um, Gas Bray is, is, is not a main thoroughfare, uh, although it is a busy parking area. Uh, and if someone wished to provide a parking space to this in an area which was not um, a conservation area, they'd be allowed to do so. Um, I'm also persuaded uh, by the applicant's suggestion of page 131 that in fact if they park the car there they actually dice with, well maybe dicing with death a bit much, but they take a chance coming in and out of gas bray less often if they park their car there than they do if they reverse up, unload it and take it back out again. So I think that is quite a persuasive argument. In fact from a road safety point of view you're coming in and out less if you park than if you, if you don't. Um, when this was considered previously, there was the consideration of the of the um, the other aspects of the of the um, the development, which have now been cleared up. So, I think on this occasion, uh, I'm inclined to overturn the decision. And as Councillor Gray said, good luck to people coming in and out of the end of Croft Terrace. But I think it's a free um, sort of up to the turn and the refusal. Thank you. Yes, I'm just uh, aware that uh, the practice is to delegate to Mr. Harris and myself uh, any conditions. I'm just wondering whether there are further conditions that <coughs> could appropriately be applied or need, need to be applied to the consent. I don't know, I've had a chance to discuss that with um, uh, Mr. Harrison. The, the, only, the only consideration is to some extent the, the one you see in, in front of you in the photograph here. Obviously, the applicant's gone so far uh, in creating the parking space and then I think put things on hold, as it were. Um, I think there's maybe you might want to clarify what will be the final surface of the parking space um, because of its position in the conservation area. That, that would be the only consideration that would come to mind. Would the parking space relate? Uh, would it be worthy of note that the parking uh, space should relate purely to the uh, property currently delineated by the Brick 
there as it is at the moment, but must not bark on the common piece of fact. Um, was that not relevant? Um, well, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about the normal direction that uh, about enforceability and um, there's a limit to how far in a condition you can go. Um, it would be out with the curtilage of the development, therefore it wouldn't be authorised, but it would then become a private matter. Um, mm. I, I know what you mean about it, it's it's not really finished there, and it's not it's not marked, um, it, it's mm. not a finished mm. proposal. Um, I think uh, we we don't have clarity as to whether the applicant actually has control of the lane beyond a right of access, as well. We we don't know where ownership lies there, so it may not be an enforceable condition in that context, also. I'm not particularly precious about that point, um, frankly, because I think uh, we're talking about one neighbour who may or may not wish to have a vehicle here at some point to take a thing out. Um, are we obliged to make any condition on that point? No. We, we will, there will be a condition regarding the thing. I think, I think, I believe you, Mr. Harris, can certainly delegate to you that, that it must be finished in. An appropriate, an appropriate sir. But as regards the, the use of the lane, I think I think we've come to the conclusion that that no such mm. requirement is actually there. So that was the answer you were looking for. So thank you for your attendance. <laughs> um, now, if we can move on, colleagues, to the last item which is item 4.4, four, and this is <coughs> application of the erection of a dwelling house in principle mm. on land 120 metres northwest of Loak Mill Farm Bank Foot. Uh, Mr Harrison, can I ask you to introduce this application for review? Uh, thank you, Convener. As you say, there's a planning application in principle for the erection of a dwelling house at land 120 metres northwest of Loak Mill Farm Bank Foot. The site extends to some 1.2 hectares, most of which is farmland, which generally slopes down from west to east. The site contains a derelict building of what remains of the original corn mill. The site lies to the west of the A9 road and is accessed via the previous alignment of this road and a shared private track with the former Loak Mill farm steading, which has been converted to housing but you might like to have page 191 and 197 onwards, provided the location plan, a site plan, and indicative drawings of the siting and a house design. The general sequence of the photographs will be the Loak Mill farmhouse development, the site itself, the former mill, and then the site from the lower level and then the upper level. So I say this is us uh, looking across, so we say to the south from the access road, uh, looking at the area of what appears to be land being used as garden ground in association with Loak Mill. That's the for former farmhouse, which you can see on the extreme right of the photograph there on the other side of the Gary Burn. Uh, I also mentioned that there appears to be a pond created in that area which is, uh, it seems to be a similar arrangement to what was originally proposed uh, with the first application uh, for the convert or the redevelopment of the, the, the mill uh, building uh, on the previous application, which has lapsed. So moving to the right of that photograph, uh, we see a little bit more of that garden ground and Loak Mill steading buildings and other buildings which have been converted the right of that photograph, we then look down the access track uh, and we start to take in the application site, but you might just be able to make out the one of the steading conversion buildings on the left-hand side of the photograph there between the trees. It shows you a relationship between the two. And certainly you can make out the bridge. So swinging to the right of that photograph, we see the, uh, the main body, as it were, of the application site and we see the former mill building. And if 
from that station we move down the access road uh, and have a, a, closer, a closer appearance of the, ac the access to the application site and the building that remains there and the rising ground behind me. So we go down the access road, uh, we cross the bridge and just give you an indication of the gallery burn and then the entrance to the application site. So we're just catching the former mill building there and as you can see the application site uh, rises from that level up towards the, uh, the ridge. So swinging slightly to the right of that photograph we look directly into what was the previous uh, application site in the former mill building and then from that position we go past the mill building and we look at the uh, the rear of the building itself. You can see it's partially set into the rising ground. And then swinging to the right of that photograph, we look up the slope. Uh, and this is all part of the application site. And it's basically with the yellow line giving an indicative position of the house uh, shown on the drawings. And then swinging to the right of that again, we're still getting the indicative position of the house and the remainder of the application site uh, in that northerly direction. And then if we swing round again to the right of that photograph, we're looking up the remainder of the lower level of the application site, looking in that northwesterly direction. And obviously you can see the Gary Burn uh, just on the right hand side of that photograph. So if we swing round again from that same position, we look across the Gary Burn in the direction of the A9 and as you can see in that photograph we have the land on the opposite side of the Gary Burn which is enclosed by the blue line in the plan with additional land in the applicant's ownership and then we have the trees and the rising ground up to the A9 beyond that. So if we move on from there uh, up to shall we say the westernmost corner of the site and this is us looking in a northerly direction towards Bank Foot. And we'll have a sequence of photographs now swinging round from that corner of the site. So if we swing to the right of that, uh, we look down the application site towards the A9. You might be able to pick out a vehicle in the A9 from that position. It's the existing A9. Obviously, there's a dueling process in, in taking place at the moment. In the northeasterly direction, we swing round again from the same position. Uh, slightly more elevated position, move to the right, we look down the application site across the indicative position of the proposed house and you can see the former mill there and we have the bank of trees adjacent to the A9 in that photograph too and beyond that you might even be able to make out some of the earthworks taking place at the moment in association with the duelling process. Swing round again to the right of that, we look along so we see the top of the application site, uh, the, the rising ground there, and we're looking in the direction towards the, the, the original farmsteading. We move from that position down that boundary, uh, so we now look across in a westerly direction, across, shall we say, to the countryside beyond the west, and again from that position there's a sequence of photographs swinging round. First of all to the right, looking across the application site towards bank foot, to the right again, looking over the, as it were, the top of the, uh, the, the, the mill building and towards the A9, to the right again, we look and we catch the access road there and beyond the trees we have the work taking place on the A9 and to the right again of that, uh, we still have that southern end of the application site and the buildings that have been converted as part of the steading and again, the further part of the application site, looking down to the steading conversion. Uh, and just for clarity, this is the other land I mentioned earlier in the applicant's ownership on the far side of the Gary Burn. And I'll just leave you with that general photograph. Turning first of all, in summary to the applicant's case, detailed planning permission was granted in 2007 for the erection of a two-storey house on the site of the mill building. The proposal was accepted as a replacement and reconstruction of the mill, 
the upper story of which has been removed. This proposal required land raising and the provision of compensatory flood storage on the field on the east to minimise flood risk from the Gary Burn. This planning application was never implemented and has lapsed. It is recognised that the resubmission of this proposal would be contrary to Local Development Plan Policy EP2, New Development and Flooding, because it would involve land raising within a functional floodplain. Regarding the first reason for refusal, the proposal falls to be assessed against Local Development Plan Policy RD3 and the new house in the, in the countryside, open countryside category of the associated guidance of 2014. The guidance makes provision for the conversion or replacement of redundant non-domestic buildings and this was accepted in the 2007 planning consent. The planning history is a relevant material planning consideration in assessing the current proposal. It is considered that the principle of residential development is established by this previous consent. As the Local de Development Plan policy presumes against land raising on a functional floodplain, the current proposal is to relocate the proposed house out with the floodplain, but close to the original site. The repositioning is acceptable to the Council's flooding section. Regarding the second reason for refusal, the site is not considered to be highly visible from the A9 as it is screened by a cutting, trees and intervening buildings. As such, the indicative proposal is seen as demonstrating that the house would not have a significant adverse visual impact on the surrounding countryside. The rising ground is seen as providing a backdrop and it is envisaged that the house would be below the skyline. Examples of other developments that have been provided uh, have been provided which are seen as being similar to and therefore supportive of the current proposal. Regarding the third reason for refusal, the proposed house would not be sited on the footprint of the mill building. It is considered that the principle of demolishing the mill building has been accepted. It is considered that, as this is an in-principle application, the assessment of the presence or otherwise of bats in the mill building could be made the subject of a suspensive planning condition with any mitigation measures that may be necessary undertaken at that stage. Turning now in summary to the officer's report of handling, it is recognised that part of the site, including the former mill building, is at risk from flooding. There was a planning consent for the replacement of the mill building with a house back in 2007. That permission was never implemented and has expired. The site does not have the benefit of any planning consent. Consequently, the applicant's view that the principle of the development of, the, of a house is established is not accepted. The application site lies within the countryside, therefore the proposal is assessed against Local Development Plan Policy RD3 and the criteria of the Associated Housing and Countryside Guidance, a policy and guidance that postdates the earlier planning decision. In this instance, the relevant categories that might lend support to the proposal are new houses in the open countryside and the conversion or replacement of redundant non-domestic buildings. The existing mill building is not considered to be suitable for conversion to a house due to the level of flood risk. Therefore, its demolition was assessed as being justified. Support for a replacement building is dependent on the footprint of the original building being at its core. As this proposal seeks to erect a dwelling house in principle in a different location from that of the existing mill building, it cannot be considered to fall within this category. As a new house in the open countryside, there can be support for the relocation of a house to the nearest alternative site, where the house is at risk 
of risk from flooding uh, and is to be demolished. However, this policy re relates to the relocation of an existing house that is at risk. In this instance, the former will mill building is not an existing house and has never been a residence. Consequently, it cannot be considered or supported under this category. In addition, the prospective siting of the proposed house is viewed as being prominent in the landscape and would not have suitable enclosure or backdrop as there are no established trees or topographical features that enable it to blend sympathetically into its landform. There is a lack of definable boundaries and post and wire fencing is not accepted as creating a definable site. There is an expectation that the proposal would be extremely prominent in the landscape, including views from the A9, an important tourist route. In this context, the proposal is also seen as failing to meet the siting criteria of the guidance. It is accepted that the prospective hilltop position would eliminate any flood risk. It is noted that the Perth and Congross Heritage Trust recommend the retention of the former bill bill former mill, mill building due to its archaeological interest. The Council's guidance requires a preliminary assessment of the presence of bats within the former bill building to be undertaken as part of the assessment of the proposal. This survey was not requested as the proposal was unacceptable for other reasons in principle. In this case there are no representations. There is both a request for a site visit and for a hearing. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Harrison. Are there any questions for officers on the application for review? Uh, Councillor Gray. Yes. No yes. question. Councillor Brock. Just, um, just on Mr. Harrison, um, I can understand why, understand the reason why we can't build a house on top of the mill because of the flooding risk or whatever. Um, but hypothetically, if it could, this the second reason why. Um, it's been um, refused, ER6, the uh, Manage and Future Landscape Change to con Conserve. Would that not apply in that position? If it, it I'm, I'm trying to take the right way. <laughs> so you're, you're um, um, if, if we go back to the original position where the mill is at the moment, yes. hypothetically, what I'm trying to say is if, if that could be built there, are we saying in that location there is no problem with landscaping. So I'm, not, I'm trying to ask it the right way. I think, well, first of all, I, I don't think, well, the officer hasn't, first of all, expressed a, a view on that one way mm. or the other. Uh, it's obviously set at a lower level. Um, uh, the existing building is set at a lower yes. level. Um, Presumably the landscape around it would, would, it would comply with it. Well, I'm asking I the right way, I'm trying to. I think, I think if I maybe take you back to an earlier photograph, If this assists you in in any way, uh, that shows you the, the difference in levels. If, if you're asking about that, so the, the officer, I think, in in simple terms, has not understandably expressed a view one way or the other on that, uh, mainly because the, the the original consent for the replacement of the mill building has, as I say, lapsed and expired. So. Uh, in short, uh, it's not seen, it is a material consideration in the sense that it's part of the planning history of part of the application site, uh, but whether or not it, that development, well, as the development really is not going to take place, for one reason or another, I don't think he's, in short, expressed a view, and I think probably wouldn't be appropriate for me to do so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, are you okay, Rob? Um, Mr. Harrison, could I ask you to go back to the, there was a slide I think which said looking northeast toward the A9. Uh, if, if you if you can stop me, um, I should go. Well, that that, that was one. That You'd, there are others. Is it is that is it that one or will I move on? Um, well, um, I think if I have one question on this one, am I right in thinking the houses you can see in the distance? There are houses closer to this site, are there? 
we were going to receive the steading. Was what you mentioned about a steading development. Well, the, the, the st right, the, the, one, the ones you see in this photograph yeah. are of all part of the buildings as you that were enter into bank foot. Yeah. Um, the steading uh, is on the, as you'll see, extreme right hand side <coughs> excuse me, of the photograph you see here. So if we move on from that, the, yeah. um, it swings around towards the right. You're just catching the roofs yeah, so of the that, steading. That's, so that, that, that's the closest buildings to this site, is that right? The yes, they would houses. be the closest buildings, yeah. Now, was there another photograph yeah. to do with the A9 you wanted? No, no, it was just to see, to see the, the, the nearest housing to the, in relation to the old mill building, which I see there, and also to in relation to the site. So that, that I'm happy with that. Okay. Um, so, members, we can make a preliminary decision, I think. Can we proceed to determine the application for review on the basis of the information before us? That is, the information contained within the papers and the presentation by the planning advisor or do we require more information? Uh, Councillor Gray? No, no, no. no. Councillor? No, I too have sufficient information. Um, so we can move to debate. Uh, so having considered the applicant's papers, the report of handling, the Perth and Gross Local Development Plan and all other relevant material planning considerations, uh, I, I will start us off, colleagues. Um, I have to say uh, straight away that I'm in agreement with the decision notice, um, it seems to me this is very much a, a new house in the open countryside. I'm not persuaded by any of the arguments relating to the, uh, in, in inverted commas, reuse, shall I say, of the old mill building. Uh, I think there's a lack of screening or enclosure. Uh, I think it's not a defined site. And I think it was mentioned also the hilltop position. So I have a feeling this is precisely the sort of development that um, the housing and the countryside policy was, was um, developed to prevent. So I think with, a, with, with a possibly a change or two of wording, I'm happy to uh, concur with the reasons for refusal, all three reasons for refusal. Um, Councillor Brock. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm inclined to agree with you on this one. I, I do have some sympathy for the applicant in as much that uh, they can't reapply uh, in original and build on the on the site of the mill. Um, it's unfortunate, obviously, the policies have changed, and to some extent, I, I have a bit of sympathy that they'd perhaps move the house, and, and there'd be a flexibility in that particular instance. But we still come back to this point of the um, location and the uh, landscape. And even if you ignore policy uh, refusal reason number one, you're still with two and of course three. So uh, I think overall I'd have to con concur with the planners, but as I say, I do have a bit of sympathy for the applicant, but in this instance, we have to agree with them. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Brock. Councillor Gray. Yeah, I'm going to agree again. Um, frankly, this uh, proposal bears no relation at all to the uh, previous um, site site of the old mill and to call it Loft Mill, Loat Mill Barn, well that's stretching it some, somewhat by about 50 metres or something. Um, it's not on the site, therefore it doesn't comply with anything to do with the demolition or the replacement of the uh, barn and it's simply as you suggest a house in the open countryside, a random site, a chosen site high up with an elevation and with a bit of view I presume. Um, and I just can't see any justification for uh, approving it. And I would, but I would say that you know the third reason for refusal. I'm not particularly convinced about the third reason. Uh, it, it's there, but it's not of any significance. But the first two reasons are absolutely correct, um, uh, and I'm happy to go along with my two colleagues. Councillor Gray, it's another uh, unusual display of unanimity. Um, uh, I think, um, Mr. Fogg, I think we, we're all agreed, I think. Uh, with regard to Councillor Gray's point um, of, of, of item three, or reason three, I think it might be helpful uh, if we were to add, just what it says in the bottom line, uh, to demonstrate the presence or otherwise of protected species. I take in Councillor Gray's point. Mm. But we, don't, we don't know. 
but other than that, yeah, yeah. I think that's our, that's our position. Have you anything to add to that, Mr. Adams? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. I'm happy, Mr. Clark. So that concludes this meeting of the Labour Review Body. Thank you for your attention.